Chapter 1, Introduction to Me, Joey Tomaselli. The title of this story is Tira Avante, Push Forward. I'm telling my story to help others who suffer from anxiety, depression, OCD, phobias, or for anyone who needs hope, belief, and a guide to always push forward and never give up. I can remember having anxiety as early as six years old. I used to be so scared of Sundays growing up for whatever reason. I was so afraid of coming up with anything to write in my journal as a young kid and I remember I would get major anxiety of not being able to write anything on paper. Sundays would represent no hope in completing homework, and I just dreaded that day for years to come. I was a class clown growing up, funny kid, but the teachers had a hard time keeping me quiet. Never was I good in school. I loved gym, and that's it. Every other class, I did not pay attention, and I did not enjoy. Pretty much where my OCD started was in 1993, it was September, it was my sister's birthday, and OCD walked into my life. What happened was she was having a birthday party, and I was three years younger than her, but I was allowed to be there. There was a chip on the floor in a bag, and at that time, Magic Johnson just discovered that he had AIDS, and I remember watching an earthquake movie about the San Francisco earthquake in the 1989 World Series. Now, where that comes together is I ate the chip out of the bag, asked me why I did this when there was tons of food inside in the hall where my sister was having her birthday. I ate the chip and my sister looked at me and said, why would you do that? Now you're going to have AIDS. I'll never forget. It just clicked on me right there and I went into freak mode. Literally, as soon as I got home, I start washing my hands religiously, taking a lot of showers. I remember something as silly, or well, wasn't silly at the time, my first French kiss when I was in grade seven. I French kissed a girl, and the first thing I said to her, do I have AIDS now? She looked at me like, thank God you're good looking, but that was the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. Teachers knew I had a problem. I, I was allowed to get up during class if I felt like I touched something, and I was allowed to go wash my hands whenever I wanted. My dad had a hard time understanding this. My dad came from a little town in Italy and nothing feared the guy. He tried to show me tough love. He meant well, but my OCD was even stronger than him. I remember once when I would go to bed and I would go to sleep with socks on my hands. And my dad was like, come downstairs. I want you to wipe the toilet seat. And I remember he told me to wipe the toilet seat to show me nothing would happen. So I had to pretend that I wiped it, which I did, went to my bed, waited an hour and a half with my hands in the air like I was about to make a save as a soccer goalie, went back downstairs and he screamed at me because I went to go wash my hands. Not knowing how powerful of a stranglehold OCD had over me, I had to wash my hands. He did not understand that. Soccer was a big part of my life growing up. I was a really good soccer player. When I received OCD as a gift, I don't know how to say it, but I was having trouble tying my soccer shoes, getting involved in activities with the other gentlemen and boys, sweat coming on me. I had a hard time playing the game. My mom brought me to see a psychiatrist, and he suggested I need meds that would help, but it would make me a lot slower. And at the time, I'm like, I'm already slow to begin with. I looked at my mom, and I had a sense of humor at 13 and said, if I take these pills, you're going to have a zombie. I would rather take my chances on my own. When I turned 15, which was about 1995, I was introduced to weed. And I'm telling you, as bad as drugs is for you, I remember my first joint that I smoked, my OCD just vanished. It became my meds. The problem was I needed weed every day. I needed weed to go out. I needed weed to fall asleep. I basically used weed to go anywhere, whether it was to the mall, whether it was a wedding, whether it was a date, whether it was school during recess or if we had lunch break. I was smoking weed all the time and it was amazing to me because I just didn't give a crap about washing my hands. I remember I went to Italy at 16 years old to try out for a professional soccer team and I made the team. They had a contract offer and I remember thinking, they don't have weed here. I can't do this, but I couldn't tell my dad because he's built like Incredible Hulk. So I turned it down. I said I was homesick and I'll never forget when he looked at me. He says, you sure you want to do this? I said, yeah, I want to go home. And I'm telling you, I only came home because they didn't have the weed that was helping me with my OCD. I got out of high school. Basically, it was a miracle. My guidance teacher gave me corresponding courses to complete at my own at home. Technically, I should still be in high school today. Chapter 2. What a waste of my 20s. LOL. I started off my 20s, was in a relationship at 21 years old. I started dating this beautiful girl, very nice, but she hardly seen a sober JT. I had so many jobs, no ambition, terrible boyfriend, and was getting fired every three months. I was a very loving boyfriend. 
but I cheated on her and felt terrible doing so. I felt like I was missing out all the time, and that was giving me a lot of anxiety. I started to do heavy drugs. I needed weed when I travel. I remember going away to Jamaica, Aruba, etc., etc., and the first thing I did was look for weed and tell my girlfriend at the time, we need to go find weed. I don't care. We're not putting our bags down until I find some weed. I remember in Jamaica putting us in a tricky situation in the middle of the alleyway, and the guy took all my money when all I wanted was some weed. Soccer was gone at this point. Boy, did I miss that dearly. That was my whole life growing up. Dreams of soccer became nightmares now because I knew that time in my life was done. I lost my identity. I had glimpses of hope, but it never lasted. I became very, very lazy, and I always felt bad that she never got what she deserved. In 2008, I broke up with her. It was a hard breakup, but I knew at that point in my life I had to move on. I moved out. I was not ready to move out, but I partied really hard, and boy, did I make up for those seven years of being with her. I lost my job at the time. It was a sad and bad breakup. What I did was I stayed at my place for about 11 months. I rented out my place because I figured it was much easier to get a friend to live with me in a two-bedroom and my cost being, say, $2,000 a month, what is now $800 a month. My dream was to find a place that looked over the city high up. I wanted to look over everything and admire the whole city. That was my dream. My wish came true, but for how long? 2009, April 15, I moved into my new place, 44th floor up in the air, looking over this whole city. I dreamed about this day and moment to be single, looking over the city by myself. Boy, was this dream about to become a nightmare. Chapter 3, April 16, 2009, 11.55 p.m. Before that date and time, I was feeling off. For some reason, I just wasn't myself. I was pouring water on my face. I was scared of my own patio that I just rented in my new place. It was on the 44th floor. I was petrified of it. I always wanted this, so why did I feel like this? Weed up to that moment was actually crippling me. Every time I would smoke a joint up to that date, I was feeling more and more off, and I loved my weed. Why was it making me feel like this? I'll never forget that night. It was the first night I moved in. My roommate was working. I was going to go meet him. He worked at a nightclub, and I was dying to go out and start my new life with him. I sparked my last joint at 11.50 p.m. 2009, and I'll never forget that day because I will never smoke a joint going forward in my life. I'll never forget. I smoked that joint. I took a pull. I felt the building move. My mind started racing. I remember like it was yesterday. I was eating Vector cereal, and then it happened. I had the biggest panic attack of my life. I'll never forget. I jumped in my car and drove to my parents. I was sweating like I did two hours of cardio driving in my car all the way from downtown Toronto to Brampton. I swear to God, it was the longest drive of my life. I woke up my mom at 12.45 a.m. Her eyes told me how bad I was. I'll never forget her face. She gave me some sleeping pills, but my body fought it. I woke up at 7 a.m. and walked around my basement for two hours till 9 a.m. I had to call the doctor office because I knew I needed to see someone fast. The doctor said, I'm very busy. I'll see you Monday, Joey. I thought to myself, I'll never make it to Monday. I walked all weekend so much that my calves seized up. My mind was racing. I couldn't stand still. I couldn't eat. I quit cigarettes and weed in one shot. On top of the anxiety, the walking, the fearfulness that I had, I started to get cold sweats. My dad thought it was the drugs, heavy drugs. I remember looking at me during dinner and saying, what the hell did you do? And I let him know I smoked a lot of weed. And at the time, I thought weed was doing this to me. My friend Niels, who I moved in with, who's a good friend of mine today, was very worried and angry and confused. Because you got to understand, I left him after we just signed a one-year lease. I finally went to go see my doctor on the Monday. I knew for some reason I begged for pills. He said, come back in two weeks and I'll see what we could do and maybe give you something. Those next two weeks felt like two years. As I go on my stories, I'll mention numbers of how many professionals I've seen or saw over the next four years. Professional number one, I was sent to see a psychiatrist. I thought because I hurt my ex and leaving her, this was all happening to me. Maybe it was karma, maybe I deserve this. He gave me a prescription right away after hearing what I had to say. He thought I was very depressed, and he looked at me and said, you need drugs, my friend, and you need something to help you right away. So what happened is I took lorazepam, 
and I felt relief for the first time in almost three weeks. As soon as it entered my mouth, I told my mom, I think I'm going to need these pills for the rest of my life. I called anyone who I was having a fight with in the past and said sorry. I really felt like I had to relieve all the issues I had with anyone growing up or anyone who I let down and I needed to say sorry. Every time I tried to go back to the condo where my friend Niels was living, I would panic. I could even go up and last a minute up there. Niels at this point was getting angry. I left him high and dry. I understood why he was angry, but at the same time I tried to tell him that I was dying. I was suffering inside, but we were butting heads and I totally get where he was coming from at that time in his life. But I was just trying to survive. I had shit times. I remember people saying, did you hear what happened to Joey Tomaselli? I think he went crazy. That, at that moment in my life, I did not need to hear that. But like I said, I was in survival mode. I didn't care what people were saying about me, even though I know deep down inside I did. Early June, I was taking three lorazepams a day. I started to go out. I figured if I just take these lorazepams, I could go out and party like I used to. Big mistake. I started drinking on them. I was not working anymore, and I finally got a job. My friend Peter gave me a job with his brother being a landscaper. I thought maybe I'd need to do hard work for the first time in my life and be in the outdoors. I started realizing that the lorazepam wasn't doing the trick no more. I started feeling anxiety. So my doctor said, why don't you try Prozac? So I was taking my Prozac with my lorazepam. I started working, was working hard. It helped for a bit. I remember once I was having a bad day and I made a big mistake and I called my ex because I needed comfort. I needed an answer. Just got a person who needed the same thing on the other end. And the worst part is, I should have never called her to get comfort when she needed comfort from our breakup. I regret doing that, but at that time I thought maybe she would give me a helping hand and her hug would make it all go away, but it definitely made things worse. But I remember, the Prozac started tripping me out. I started seeing hyenas walk across me, and they weren't even there, and I started asking my friends, do you see these animals? It was really getting me to the Prozac. Now, if I could go back in time when I was doing heavy drugs, maybe I would have took Prozac. But at this point, I did not need Prozac. July 9th, 2009th, my birthday party. My last birthday where I drank anything for a long time. I remember waking up after my birthday, freaking out. It was a Sunday, telling my mom, I don't know where I am. I think it was a combination of mixing lorazepam and Prozac with heavy drinking. I went to the doctor's office on Monday, and guess what? He gave me depression pills. And then the meltdown. July 9th to August 29th, I literally died. I literally struggled every day and every night. Professional number two, I found a therapist in the newspaper. His role was very brief, and I only seen him once, but he told me how to get off the lorazepam. Basically, what he said was take your dosages and start taking one pill, half a pill, quarter of a pill, and take it down to nothing. It definitely worked, but I had the shakes. I felt like I've never taken heroin, but getting off of heroin must have felt like this. Chapter 4. He promised me he could fix me. October 2009. Professional number 3. I was told to call this hypnotist. When I called him, he told me to leave my house that night, go have fun, and the next day, he would make me perfect. That was my first night out since my birthday. It was October Thanksgiving weekend. I went out that night, and I did not enjoy that night. I should have never went out that night. My mom drove me the next day to go see him. The first thing he did was put me under. As he put me under, he was talking to me, but I was not hypnotized. He kept telling me I was on a boat in the 1400s. I did not feel anything. I was not on his boat. I was on his couch. He kept telling me there was pirates around, and that's the reason why I was feeling all this anxiety today. I opened my eyes. I said, this is not working. I looked at my mom. I said, let's go. I gave him his money. I was not happy. It was more money spent on nothing. Left his house, cried on the way home. And I was just at this point, it was too many people not helping me. And I did not enjoy that night. Chapter five. Hello, my old friend, Mr. OCD. October 28, 2009. Professional number four. I was referred to a life coach who was amazing, my friend told me. She told me she wanted to spray a natural formula in my mouth, and she told me it was going to calm me down. Big mistake. As soon as she sprayed that formula in my mouth, the 13-year-old Joey, who suffered bad from OCD, came right back. I had anxiety, 
depression, and now my OCD came back. And guess what? I had an amazing phobia of blood that came out of nowhere. I remember I told her I don't want to be sprayed in my mouth. She promised me it would make me better. As soon as she sprayed my mouth, the 13-year-old OCD Joey Tomaselli came right back. Boy, was this a tough time. I already had the depression anxiety. I did not need the OCD to come back in my life. I remember shaking hands, meeting people, but I was observing their cuts on their hands. If they had little nicks and knacks, I would go wash my hands. Red marks became hazards for me. Scabs on hands. I would lose my mind right away. I start taking showers two times, three times a day. I remember losing my right hand like it's been cut off at war and I couldn't use my hand for 24 hours. I put it in my mind if I touched something that I thought was blood or I thought was dirty, I became left-handed out of nowhere. And boy, those were tough 24 hours. Dating was fun, I'll tell you that. Imagine dating me and coming into my car and I offer you hand sanitizer when I enter my car. I'm very lucky that I look like Hugh Grant and the girl accepted it, but it was tough pouring some hand sanitizer in her hand before she entered my car. I only peed at the bathroom of my parents' house. That was very difficult because I did not want to pee in any public bathrooms or any bathrooms at my friend's house. I would be holding in my urine for hours at a time, dying to get home to use my own bathroom. You see, I couldn't use any other bathroom but the one at home. God help me if I took a pee and I hit the toilet seat and I seen it splash back and touch one of my pants, my leg, or my shoes, I would throw those items out. My love life was very difficult. My own fluid that came out of my body I treated like poison. I was seeing red everywhere. I was like a bull in Spain. I was throwing out everything. I started becoming a habit to throw out my shoes. I would be going to malls three, four times a day buying the same pair of shoes. I remember the girl at the store at Yorkdale was saying, didn't you just buy these shoes two days ago? And I would tell her I lost them. I lied to her because I needed a new pair of shoes. The back of my truck started looking like an Aldo store. I had empty shoe boxes everywhere. Throwing out clothes, people with their hands would touch me and I would very smartly look at their hands and say, oh, I like your ring. But meanwhile, I saw a little nick on their finger I would throw out my sweater. I was running out of clothes. That was empty time in my life. Buying replacements was almost impossible. What I mean by that, when I would go buy another pair of boots, if the girl or the gentleman selling me the shoes and she had a cut or anything on her hand, and I think I start making up these cuts, I would buy them, throw them out in the garbage, and go for another drive to buy the same damn pair. I would ask to scan the items myself. They looked at me, you don't work here. I said, I wish I did and I would scan it. I used my humor to get away with it, but at the inside of me, I was crying. Driving with no back seat, and I'll tell you what that means. One day I went to go pick up my nephew. His friend started bleeding on his left leg. My back seat was now a two-seater, which used to be a five-seater. That back seat was off limits. Someone bled back there, I did not need that room no more. I remember driving in my Jeep Cherokee at the time, If people would come into my car and throw my stuff in the back, i just say to myself, fuck, I'm never going to use that stuff again. Or I would ask them, can you put my suitcase or my bag on top of your lap? And they'd be like, you got all that room in the back. And I'd be like, bear with me, just carry everything on your lap. Professional number five. I was referred to this gentleman, Will. A kind soul who used to be heavy on drugs himself and he was now, quote, healing people. My friend Michelle introduced me to him, who said he helped her so much. So what I did was give him a call. He was very heavy on energy, meditations. My parents, especially my dad, had trouble seeing this older man enter my home that looked like, kind of looked like Wayne Gretzky with gray hair. My dad could understand why you paying this gentleman to come inside our house. He helped me for a bit. He was a good person. But I'll never forget that one fly that was in my bathroom ended my life for weeks. I remember I had to put stuff around my toothbrush and flies have become the biggest problem in my life. Will, unfortunately, was no match for even this simple little thing as a fly flying around in my bathroom with my toothbrush. I remember breaking down in front of my mother hard that night. I still appreciate Will to this day for trying everything he could to help me. Professional number six had another girlfriend of mine telling me I should try this nice Greek older lady who does bone therapy. Now, I'm not sure if you know what bone therapy is. You talk for a bit, they put you on a bed, and they move parts of your body and shift things around. 
I had a great talk with her at first. I cried out my pain. Everything came out at that time. The treatment itself made me go crazy. For some reason, as soon as she touched my neck and my head, I tripped out. It's like the future self was telling me to tell her to stay away from my neck. I had another full-fledged panic attack. I regretted that treatment for four years, but her touching my neck and head was a sign of things to come. I freaked out on her, jumped in my Jeep, drove home, and I remember seeing my parents, and they were like, what the hell happened? And I told them, I don't know what the hell just happened to me. I remember when I was having the panic attack on her little bed that she had, I was biting on her finger. She said that would help, but boy, was that a treatment I wish I never went to. Chapter 6. Things that still make me laugh today. Growing up, I was a popular guy. I was very good with the ladies. I had never had a problem introducing myself or meeting girls or taking them out. But you have to remember, I now had depression, anxiety, and OCD. These stories still make me laugh today. I once went over to a girl's house who lived on her own. Check out this outfit I had on. Try to envision it in your mind. I had dress shoes on, no laces, track pants, white socks, and a fucking leather jacket. How disgusting is that combination? Try to think of that in your mind. I walked in and I remember she was like, what the hell are you wearing? And I played it off and said, I forgot all my stuff at my friend's house. This is all I had left. She goes, you don't have any clothes at your house. And again, my sense of humor, I got away with it. But the white socks with dress shoes alone is terrible. Where were my laces? I remember laces at the time. If they touched the floor by any chance, I would throw out the laces and walk around with my shoes with no laces on. So we sat down. She started smoking shisha. Now you got to remember, I'm afraid of marijuana at this time in my life. Anything with smoke, guess what happened? I tripped out and left her there. I loved my weed. Now I was afraid of it. It used to be my favorite person in the world. Even though it wasn't a human being, I treated it like one. Walking to my car, seeing something red near my shoes on the ground, I would toss my boots. I remember walking with this girl back to my Jeep, thinking I stepped on something that was red, staring at the floor, and she was like, Joey, can we leave? I took off my boots on the spot and walked back to my car with my socks on. She looked at me like I was on acid. I'll never forget her face. She's like, you're going to leave your boots there? I go, yeah, they're really bothering my toes. Get in the Jeep. Walking to my car seemed something like a mission to me now. I remember looking down on the floor all the time. I would go to, say, Shopper Drug Mart, jumping over tiles to get to the next item that I needed. I remember people in the store looking at me. What is he? Does he, does he think he's an American Gladiators? What is he doing? Walking along the aisle, dry humping it, just not to touch the red piece on the floor. I went to another girl's house. I actually went to her house with no shoes on. I'll never forget her opening the door to her house or her condo looking at me and said, where are your shoes? And I let her know something happened to them and I had to throw them out. Can I come in? My feet are freezing. Shaking hands with somebody or to buy something from a store again, it was a suffering time. I would pretend to strike up a conversation with someone selling the item just to observe their hands. And I remember they would look at me like I was being a pervert, but I was actually just looking to see how clean their hands were. I remember grabbing their hands and say, oh, I love this bracelet. I was talking pure shit. I just wanted to see what was on their hands. Any girl who I'd pick up in my Jeep would have to shower in my hand sanitizer. I couldn't have any of those outside germs come into my vehicle. I had many occasions where I'd be at a restaurant with a girl and I was moving my head around like Stevie Wonder. I did that when I was in pain or when I was trying not to freak out. Trust me, it wasn't sexy at all. I remember people started getting the word out. Did you hear Joey? He's freaking out. I went out with him two weeks ago. He made me put sanitizer on his hands every time we came back in the truck. I swear to God, the shoe boxes in the back of my truck were starting to become like a volcano in Bali. I'll never forget my dad opening the truck and shoe boxes just falling off, spending thousands and thousands on shoes. The driving around from mall to mall would pretty much take up my whole day. I would be back sometimes the next day because I thought I stepped on something. I start feeling like an ostrich. I would bend over in the middle of a busy street with spots on the floor asking myself, is this blood? I remember taking pictures of red spots, sending it out to people and asking them, is this blood? They'd be like, Joey, go home. I was intimate with a girl one day and an hour later, 
have them on my door knocking on my shower asking me if I was okay. Because don't get me wrong, I did not mind being intimate. But the cleanup process, if you ever watched Dexter, it was like when he killed someone, he would have to clean it up perfectly. And boy, did I look very bad when I was in the shower for an hour and 10 minutes and them knocking on my shower door, are you ever going to come out? I would toss my clothes, I would toss anything and never touch it again. My passenger seat was my trunk. I would ask always, can I see your hands for a second? My friends were like, Joey, nothing's on my hands. Again, at supermarkets, buying stuff was a mission. Thank God for serving yourself at a supermarket. I started becoming a professional on those machines because I would never let anyone touch my soap, toothbrush, which I bought a lot. I became a triple jumper buying items because I would jump over everything. I would have favorite restaurants, but if I saw the cook or the server that had, say, a Band-Aid on it, those restaurants became haunted houses. I would never go back. I was called the wet water bandit. Why I was called that? I would always leave faucets on and keep them running. I remember being at a restaurant, my friends, going in the bathroom, come back, the waitress coming out. Who the fuck left the water running? I knew it was me. They knew it was me. But I would never say anything. At friend's house, I would leave the water running. Why I did that? I didn't want to touch the faucet again because I would have to wash my hands one more time. A girl would come over with a pimple on her face. I would fall apart. I'd be like, I can't even kiss her because she has a little bit of blood maybe inside that pimple. Now that sounds silly, but I remember leaving beautiful women with nothing because what I seen on their face. A girl would come over and drink wine. You got to remember at this time, I was not drinking. I was not smoking. So when she drank and she kissed me, I would fall apart worrying I would get drunk. At this point in my life, I did not drink, I did not do drugs. I remember having girls over who just smoked weed, making out with them, and I started tripping out thinking, am I going to be high? I remember I quit coffee, asking anyone if it was drinks or chocolate bars, is there coffee in it? I remember I had a coffee crisp, and that tripped me right out. Food cooked with alcohol, I would always ask if it had any alcohol in it, because I told them I was allergic to it. Penny Lavaca was one of my favorite pastas not no more. People would always say, your shoes always look clean or brand new, Joy. How do you keep them so clean? In my mind, it's because I fucking bought four pairs this week. That's why. I remember once at this point in my life, I was coaching soccer. I smacked a mosquito on my calf. Blood spattered on my calf. It was one of the longest showers of my life. But before that, I was at the Tim Hortons cleaning my leg. Picture this, leg seven feet in the air like I was a ballerina washing my calf on the sink while people were walking in and out. They thought I was crazy. I would take off my pants and my socks, and I went home with no pants or socks, and I would throw them out. But at this point, I was teaching soccer to younger kids, and I was coaching, was getting paid well to do so, but my uniform wasn't a uniform no more. I remember coming to the soccer facility with new clothes that were not even part of what they wanted me to wear. That was a tough conversation to have, but I did not care. Chapter 7, November 2009, The Phone Call This has nothing to do with my story in a way, but it has a lot to do how I was feeling. My mom got the call that my nana had cancer. The time of her death they gave her was 6 to 9 months. They said she had dementia, and not only that now, she has cancer. The only blessing for the next 9 months is I would drive on my only day off and be with her. That drive was the farthest I would go to see her at her house. You have to remember, at this point in my life, in my mind, I could not drive 45 minutes outside the destination where I was living with my parents. I put a little map time frame that if I drove that far out, I would panic. At this point in my life, I start working at a gym. I was selling personal training. For someone who has OCD, it's the worst place to work at a gym. People sweating, people touching me, people shaking my hands. I was washing my hands so much, running to the sinks, doing musical chairs with my coworkers just to get a clean chair. If anyone touched my chair, I'd freak out. Then I let the people know in my gym, I'm only sitting on this chair and just this desk. No one else is allowed in it. I loved my days off with my nunna nunna driving there on my Wednesdays. I remember thinking, I wish my nunna was more present during this times. She was suffering, but so was I. I really could have used her prayers and support at that time in my life. I hated that she didn't recognize me sometimes. I would spend hours holding her hand. She was my biggest fan, and she had no idea how bad I was suffering. In a way, maybe it was a blessing that she didn't know how bad I really was. 
when she would remember who I was at those little small moments, it made my day. Chapter 8. The Car Crash. November 8, 2009. I drove into someone from behind looking at my phone. I hit my head on the roof. I was in a lot of pain, but I was kind of happy that I got to go to the hospital to see if they would find something wrong with my head. They made me wait in a room for 10 hours waiting for the doctor to come see me. I would not sit on anything, a chair, a bed, looking for blood everywhere. It was a long 10 hours. The doctor who did the CAT scan said he saw something and ordered for me to have an MRI eight days later, November 16, 2009. It showed in my both tests, at the time no one seen it, that I needed major surgery. So what the doctor did is he sent me to professional number seven two weeks after that. He was the first neurologist I seen. He said, Joey, I'm looking at your MRI and your CAT scan. Everything's fine. He told me, go be active. Go lift weights. Go play sports. The pain you're feeling, Joey, it's all in your head. But I remember asking him, how come I don't feel right? I feel off balance. My vision is screwed up. I remember asking him, why do I feel like this if I'm all right? He told me, if you play sports, it will all go away. I kept that MRI CD in my room for three years, knowing in my gut I might need it again one day. What I did next, I actually booked another neurologist appointment desperate for a second opinion behind my doctor's back. The first neurologist had to be wrong. I booked the second neurologist through these girls that I met at the gym trying to sell them personal training. I was telling anyone at this point in my life my situation, hoping they might have an answer for me and give me some guidance. He was a younger gentleman. The first neurologist was older. It was eight months after I had my first opinion, and I went to go see him. He looked at me, looked at the MRI CD, and he said, Joey, you look fine. Again, why do I feel like this? I feel off. I feel dizzy. He did test, like, do the little fake hammer on my knee to see my reflexes. But I left that appointment, very disappointed, and deflated. I remember coming home and telling my mom, this does not make any sense, mom. I feel like shit. How come no one sees anything? Chapter 9. You're fucked up, Joey Tomaselli. January 10th, 2010. Another friend at this point... I was getting recommendations from everyone who could help me. My friend recommended me to see this therapist that she said was amazing. I remember sitting down with this therapist. She heard my thoughts and right away said, Joey, you're fucked up and you need major meds. She told me I need to cut myself off from social media and friends. She wanted to actually send me away to a clinic for two years. I said, I'm not going. She said to me, you'll never get better. After a year of this, Many of my friends were giving up on me. One by one, they stopped checking up on me. I remember a couple good friends of mine started saying, Joey, whatever you have been feeling should be gone by now. People were saying all the time, Joey is fucking up. His OCD is crazy. Could only have dates at my parents' basement at this point in my life. I remember meeting beautiful girls and just saying, do you mind coming over to my parents' house and we can bake cookies? I remember taking girls away going everywhere, restaurants, those days were gone. Malls, stadiums, and people driving me in their car at this point in my life was a no-no. It was a very boring, painful time in my life. My OCD was getting worse. July 10th, 2010, I turned 30. Growing up, I always pictured my 30th birthday being in Vegas or having some big party. I'd been to Vegas many times before my outburst in 2009. At this point in my life, I thought I was never going to take a vacation again. I spent my 30th birthday crying in my basement. I stopped seeing professional number nine because she said to me that nothing physically is wrong with you. I see the reports. You're fine. Maybe you are going crazy. And I remember at that time, she did make things worse, but I was even doubting myself. Am I going crazy? Chapter 10. Very, very delusional point in my life. Parents were starting to question me. Maybe he is not okay. You have to remember a year and a half went by. I remember my mom asking my niece and my nephew at the time we were very young. When Joey gets older, you need to take care of him. Tough love from my dad. He was still shocked and sad. I don't blame him. Seeing his son suffer for a year and a half was not easy on him. Professional number 11. 
I was told to see a naturopath. Maybe something organic or natural would help me. I remember he gave me tons of pills, remedies. I spent all kinds of money on this. At this time in my life, I was spending thousands on all these remedies and therapists and solutions to make me feel better. But I was afraid to take anything, natural or not natural. At this point in my life, nothing went in my mouth unless it was water or my mom's cooking. Professional number 12, I went to see a nutritionist. They start telling me, take a diet plan. Didn't do nothing. More money spent. I still carried lorazepam in my pocket everywhere I went as a safety net. I remember if I didn't have my lorazepam in my back pocket, I would not leave my house. I contacted my ex again at this point. Boy, was that a bad idea. She was working in the nightlife scene that I used to be at all the time, and I was stuck in my basement. Funny how things work out. I remember calling her and saying, I need help. And she was saying to me, just come back to me. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. And me contacting her was not fair. I was selfish to think that she could help me at that point in her life. She needed to move on. And I was calling her for help when I should have been leaving her alone. Boy, how things changed. Chapter 11. Goodbye, Nana Nono. August 10th, 2010. Cancer and dementia my grandmother had, and now falling on her head, was what killed her. When I heard, I rushed to the hospital right away. I had no shoes to go see her, so I grabbed a pair of my dad's slippers, jumped in my truck, and raced over there. I put on toxic ones, I used to think, because I did not like my dad's slippers, but I had to go see her. When I got there, she couldn't speak. She just moaned, but her eyes told me the time was ticking. My no-no actually had cancer at the same time, but we were all focused on her. I really needed her through my tough times. Her last day, when I walked in and seen her hooked up to the machines, I've never cried so hard in my life. I've never belted a cry like that. I swear to God, three or four floors must have heard me. I stood for hours because I wouldn't sit on a chair and wiped her forehead. She would look at me and others, but time was ticking. She waited till 1 a.m. till everyone left. It was me my mom, and my oldest sister, Sandra. I swear, she waited till I left for her to go. At 1.45, she passed away, and I got the call she passed. I'm actually glad I didn't hear her last breath. Her funeral was tough. I had to shake all those hands. The limo to the cemetery was the first time I let someone else drive me in two years. I hated not being in control. I wanted my anxiety and OCD to go away for those two days at her funeral so I could be present for at least a couple hours. No chance. My OCD and my physical pain made those two days even worse. At that point when we lost my grandmother, I lost my mother's support for a bit. The pain of her mom passing and now my grandfather dying was too much on her. I understandably had to take a big back seat to both of them leaving us. My mom sent me to my nunna's house to check up on my grandfather after the funeral. My nunna was outside on his porch with a blank stare. It was one of the most crushing things to see in my life. The once a week visits where I just got to see him were very nice. I would always cry leaving him every week, but we had great talks. February 2011, he was now dying. The day before he died, we had a great talk. I wanted to hug him on his bed so bad, but I seen a little spot of blood on his sheets. I remember, for some reason, I knew I should have hugged him and kissed him, but we had a great talk, and I figured there's blood there. If I go near him, I'd be in the shower for the next three hours. I felt I would come the next day, the blood would be gone, and I would give him a big hug. I was finishing work when my mom called me and said, your no has gone. I was so mad at myself and my phobia, And my mom said, don't be so hard on yourself. But I was very angry that that little spot of blood on his sheet did not make me give him one last hug and kiss goodbye. Chapter 12. Nunna dreams, my nephew and niece. My nunna start coming to me in my dreams at this point in my life. The first dream, she came to me with a letter. And I remember it was in English. And I said to her, nunna, why didn't you do this when you were alive? It's like I knew she was gone. But when she came to me in my dreams, I was so excited to see her. The letter said, Joey, you got to keep pushing forward. I know this is hard on you. God is always watching you and never give up. 
The second dream, we went for a long walk. I remember just walking with her. And I knew when the walk was over, I started to cry in my dream because I knew she had to go back. The third dream, and I'll never forget this one, I was in a crowded area. She stopped me and she actually spoke English to me. I don't mean to sound crazy, but growing up, I had this special little gift that my sister always told me that I had about my dreams. People coming to me and telling me stuff. I had friends, I would go up to them and ask them, do you have a grandfather who looks like this? He wants to say hello. I had a friend who passed away and came and told me something to tell all my friends. It would happen a lot. The third dream, though, was the most punishing. She stopped me, she looked at me, and she actually spoke to me in English, and she said, Joey, I can't keep doing this. I have to go to others. Please, find some answers. I always knew she was not alive, but again, seeing her go in my dreams hurt more than when she passed in real life. She always looked great. I knew she was not going to leave me suffering, but she couldn't give me the answers. My nonno only came once, always was a man of few words when he was alive. What was crazy, when he did come up to me in my dream, he passed me a stroller with a baby boy in it. The pain of them both gone, plus my own mental and physical pain was very hard on me. The baby, though, was a sign of good things to come. My oldest sister Sandra's house was my hangout now. My nephew Nicholas and my niece Cassie were a big part of my life at that point. They don't even realize how much they meant to me. I went from hanging out with girls and all my buddies to hanging out with a nine and a seven year old like they were my posse. They were a huge part of not giving up. My middle sister Nadia, who I loved dearly, I avoided her house because she liked to smoke weed. It was funny, she was the first person I smoked a joint with. I had looked up to her, we did a lot of fun things together, but the fact that I knew that she smoked weed was scary to me. I hated myself for being afraid of her home. I really wanted to go over her house and hang out with her but I avoided her house at all costs. She told me first after years that she was trying to get pregnant. And then I was like, that's fantastic. They were having a tough time at that time having a kid. My dream with my nunno and many emotions flooded me. I finally had a smile on my face and something to look forward to. And I remember the day she told me she was having a kid. All I could think about is that maybe now I could go back to my sister's house when she has her kid. Chapter 13, My Poor Mom and Dad The loss of my grandparents was taking a huge toll on my mom. My phobia and OCD made her a 24-7 cleaning lady. Poor thing was washing my clothes over and over again. She kept a great poker face when friends and family asked how I was doing. At this point, she felt like I might not get over this, and I remember her telling, like I said in chapters before, to my sisters and my niece and nephew, If we ever leave, please take care of them. We spent a lot of time together, though. Grabbing movies for us was the best things to do. We saw a few bright spots I had in those four years was watching movies with her and hanging out with her. She watched me many times in pain and watched me to get ready to go out only to see me look defeated, leave the driveway, come right back inside and sit back on the couch. It was too painful to go out at night. I would tell her many times, Mom, my head feels off. Mom. Why do my eyes get blurry and my vision's off? Mom, I feel so off balance today. Mom, why every time I wake up, why do I feel beat up? Mom, I don't drink or smoke weed for the last two, three years, but I still feel fucked up. She was losing patience with my OCD, but she still wasn't going to give up on me. She watched me spend so much money on seeing new people, trying new things, buying books, Thousands, and I mean thousands, was spent with no results. She would actually say to me, and she did not mean this in a mean way, Joey, maybe you should take something small. I can't see you suffering like this. Maybe you should try some medication. And I told her, I can't, Mom. Thank you, Mom. I love you so much. My dad, hardest working man I knew. I hated that I was spending all my money on these appointments. He helped pay for many of them. Therapy, I tried. I tried getting new glasses. Maybe it was my vision that was screwing me up and much more. In my lifetime, I can never work as hard as my dad did for my whole family, even if I lived to 200 years old. If he only knew how hard I was working on keeping it together and not giving up or taking my own life, I know he would have been proud of me at that time. I almost said many times, fuck this, I'm going to kill myself. I can't take this no more. 
It was a long weekend in August, 2011. I was on my third shower of the day. I only had one couch left in my whole house that I felt that wasn't contaminated enough for me to sit on. I had my head down. My body was slouch. I was not crying, but it was probably the most depressing moment in my life since I started this journey of hell. I'll never forget, my dad walked up to me, but this time he was very calm as he's ever been in his life. He looked at me and said, what's wrong, Joy? I had no words left to say to him. I was tired of telling people how bad I felt. I was a mute, angry, depressed person at that point. He said to me, come on, buddy. I don't like seeing you like this. It was the most loving and most sincere thing he has ever said to me, and it was very simple. I've never heard him talk like that to me. It was free medication with no side effects. Thank you, Dad. I love you. Chapter 14. Pain. Anxiety. Depression. Phobia. OCD. And now this. September 2011. At this point in my life, my family doctor hated seeing me so much. I was seeing him twice a month for two years. His staff hated seeing me. My whole family at this point was in Italy. I had something on my private part. I did blood work. My doctor brought me in and said, I think you have herpes. He told me to Google it, go look at the pictures. And I remember looking at these pictures thinking, oh my God, now this? And I remember one of the things it said, you start having sore calves. I remember being in bed that night. Guess what? My calves seized up. And I saw that it told me you'd start shedding. But I remember at that point, I had dry skin all over from all the showers and not drying myself properly. So I was shedding already. I lost my mind. I was air drying myself. More showers. Long, long days. Calling girls I kissed and warning them that they might have it too. Boy, were those shit times. The girl I was with, I told her, did you give this to me? She goes, Joey, I do not have herpes. Family came back. I remember they saw me as white as a ghost. My dad found me at 3 a.m. holding my private part like it was a grenade. All of my symptoms and now this, I did not want to live another day. My sister Nadia told me about an STD doctor that I should go see. I remember telling her, what's the point? Our family doctor already told me I had it. Professional number 13. So I go see Dr. Clementi. I remember sitting down with her. And telling her, do I have it? She looked at the sheet that my doctor wrote and she goes, I'm sorry, he seems to think you have it. I remember I kicked the wall and I was going crazy. She told me maybe you should see a therapist because I feel like you have a lot of anxiety. I said, no guff. As I was leaving, says, do you mind if I see it? And I said, what, my private part? She said, yes. I said, what's the point? I remember she grabbed a light, a nurse, I remember she's like, could you pull down your pants? And I was thinking as much as I was suffering, I'm the size of an infant baby right now. What's the point of showing you this? She pulls down my pants. She looks at it and she goes, oh my God, Joey, this is not herpes. This is a cut. I looked at her. I did not believe her. She swabbed it and she assured me on her profession that after she got the results back in two weeks that I was going to be fine. I did not believe her. Boy, were those a terrible two weeks. But I thank God for my sister sending me to her because if I didn't get those answers that I needed, I probably wouldn't be here today. Chapter 15, Network Marketing and Luke. Professional 14, I see my third therapist. He tried everything. He even cut his price in half per session. Nothing worked. I started feeling more physical pain at this point. I started network marketing with my friend Vince. Vince seen it all. I remember going on appointments and my mind would race. I couldn't sit still. We had big crowds at local conventions I would have to leave. I would remember driving to people's homes. I remember once his finger started to bleed. I packed up my shit and I got the hell out of there. A person that I actually tried to sign up, a part of my marketing team, came to my parents' house. I remember his finger started to bleed and he had to use my bathroom. And I remember him saying to me, why are you freaking out? I don't have AIDS. That bathroom was never used again. I started doing personal development. I watched The Secret. I made a vision board. I put a lot of things on it. I moved up fast in network marketing. I had a lot of passion. Luke was born. 
And then I remembered the little boy that my grandfather brought to me in my dream was him. Luke helped so much. He calmed me down. I became his godfather. Vince actually booked me a flight to North Carolina to go to a convention. I was thinking, I haven't left my parents' house for more than an hour away. Now in two months, I'm going to be flying. I did not sleep for two months. I had no clothes to wear to these conventions or shoes. I remember I had to drive to Muskoka for a presentation. I freaked out and I had to drive home right away. I was thinking, if I can't even go to Muskoka and not panic, how was I going to fly to North Carolina? Chapter 16. Dr. Neal and my first flight in three years. Before I met with Dr. Niels, my future therapist, I was now going to this walk-in clinic I found three times a week minimum. At that point, I was over my family doctor. Professional number 15, this sweet lady doctor, who worked at the clinic. She was helpful and had a big heart. The problem was I was going there too many times complaining or worried about something. She finally broke one day after seeing me at least 50 times and said, I think you have major anxiety, OCD, and depression. You should book an appointment with Cam H. So I made an appointment with someone there. Professional 16. I remember being in Cam H, looking at this gentleman. After hearing my story, he suggested a box of meds. I got up and I said to him, I'd rather die. As I was leaving the room, he's like, wait, I do know this one guy who could help you. That gentleman was professional 17, Dr. Neal, but he was amazing, but expensive, he said. He told me when I sat down with Dr. Neal that I'm only going to see you eight times and that's it. I remember we worked on breathing exercise. It really worked and he helped me with the blood exercises. I remember he brought me around the building, made me touch red spots and talked me through it. And it really helped me with my phobia on blood. He told me I'm going to take that flight and I'm going to get through it. And he promised me I was going to be okay. He took away the phobia of blood, which if I ever see him again, I would thank him so much for that. I flew to North Carolina for that convention. I was in so much pain those three days. I remember calling my house and I was crying. I remember talking to my sister Sandra and said, this pain, I'm suffering. I can't be here. Vince Perkilo, which was my friend, was trying to ease my pain. I couldn't enjoy my time there. I got through the trip, but my flight home was torture. I remember I was pacing. I could not sit. I had a lady complaining. I don't know if she thought I was ISIS or the Taliban, but she complained about me. I remember looking at her and saying, listen, I'm dying. I'm not going to hurt anyone on this fucking plane. The last session with Dr. Neil, I never forget this. He told me, looked me in the eye. He goes, Joey. There's nothing wrong with you mentally, but I think there's something wrong with you physically. My phobia was gone, but my anxiety and depression and my pain was still there with a touch of OCD. My journey for answers continued. Thank you, Dr. Neil, wherever you are. Chapter 17. Two Jobs and Meeting Ingrid. January 2012. I stopped coaching kids and I got a recruiting job which I made $4,000 in eight months. I really suffered during my time there. I was driving in traffic 45 minutes there and back, and my mind was racing bad and I could not concentrate. I had a friend of mine named Sandra who suggested I would go see a girl named Ingrid who did Reiki. She was professional number 18. I started off feeling really well. She had a lot of these energy tactics that she would use on me told me that there was a strong woman presence surrounding me, which I believe was my grandmother. She said to me that she sees me traveling in the future, that she actually sees me moving out. She said that one day my ex would forgive me. Three things I had no hope for at all since April 16, 2009, I actually started believing in. Ingrid would work on my whole body. She always wanted to touch my head and I said no. I remember when I did my bowing and the lady touched my head and neck and I freaked out. One day I said, fine, Ingrid, you could touch my head. As soon as she did this, I got up and snapped and had another panic attack. She barely touched me. I had a bad, bad three weeks after her touching my head. But you know what? It was leading me in the right direction. 
My dad got me an appointment to take another MRI. He knew someone at a hospital that could get me a second MRI. But I needed my family doctor to sign off on it to get me the second one. That was May 2012. Chapter 18. F.U. Doctor, which was my family doctor, you'll never see me again. June 2012. I explained to my family doctor of 32 years since I was born of my situation. I needed him to sign this MRI sheet to go and see why I was feeling all this pain. I remember him looking at me and said, sorry, Joey, no. You've been here 75 times in three years. You've already taken an MRI in 2009 that's already been done. You've seen two neurologists, Joey, one I sent to you, one you've seen behind my back. They both said you were fine. He looked at me and said, take the Prozac again. It's all in your head. I said, why? I am suffering. He told me, no, I'm not signing it. Go home. I remember I was about to leave. I looked back at him and I said, then me and you are done. I'm getting a new family doctor. He was like, good luck. That could take a year. I walked out sad, mad, and I was in so much pain. Never to see him or his assistants or his office again, I left there, and I said, I'm going to get through this. Chapter 19 I Love You, Dr. Shi July 2012 I found Dr. Shi by fluke. A girl that I met at ACN told me about him. She had an aunt that was a receptionist, and she said she could get me an appointment with him. Thank you, Angela, and your beautiful Aunt Sandra. ACN actually did me a purpose, because at that point, I was not moving forward in the company, but it was like I was meant to do ACN to get to Dr. Shi. Professional 19, my first visit with Dr. Shi. He went over my file and my history. I swear, there were so many papers on his desk. He looked at me and said, Joey, there's a lot of stuff written about you here. Let's make a deal together. I'm going to send you to St. Michael's to see the best neurosurgeon in the country. He made a deal with me, and he told me, if this neurosurgeon says you're fine, you need to take a medication. I looked at him, and I shook his hand. I said, I'll take anything you want if he says I'm fine. December 2nd was my appointment. I was actually going to go play in a soccer tournament that August, but Dr. Shi told me, do not go play in that tournament. Wait till December 2nd to see what's wrong with you, if there's anything wrong with you. He told me, do not do anything till you go see your surgeon. Chapter 20, Muskoka, September 2012. I had another job at this point again. People were starting to call me Steve Jobs. I was working with a group of beautiful people, but they could tell I was suffering bad. I couldn't sit still at my seat. I had to leave early many times. They knew something was wrong. But I discovered someone special. I remember during lunch one day, my coworker Bruno showed me a Sebastian Maniscalco clip. I swear I haven't laughed like that in years when I saw that clip. It was a great time to see that and needed that. Thank you, Bruno, for that. I ended up going away during that long weekend to Muskoka. We went boating, tubing. It was about 20 of us. We had a blast. The problem was I did not know what was wrong with my neck. So when I went tubing, I flew off the tube landed in the water head first. While everyone was having fun, I got out of the water and I felt off. I needed an Advil, my neck was killing, my head and ears were, were pounding. I did not know what was wrong with me. I was in a lot of pain. I should have on that trip been paralyzed or maybe even worse, probably died. I drove home in a lot of pain. I know someone was watching over me that trip. Chapter 21, finally an answer. December 2nd, 2012. Professional 20. I met with Dr. Howard Ginsberg, a neurosurgeon at St. Michael's Hospital. He looked at me. He wanted to do an MRI right away. He said, but it might take a couple months, maybe five to six. I said, hey, I brought a CD that I took from an MRI November 16, 2009 that I did. He looked at me and his eyes got big and he said, you still have that CD on you? I said, it's in my jacket pocket. I gave it to him. He told me, you kept this on you for three to four years? I said, yes, I never felt like I was right, and I always felt like this MRI CD had the answers. He looked at the CD in his computer. I remember his eyes went huge. They were getting bigger by the second. 
he told me, come with me, let's go take one x-ray together. When we came back from the x-ray, he told me to have a seat. He said, you need to sit down. I said, I am sitting down. He said, Joey, I don't know how to tell you this, but since 2009, November 16, you've been walking around with your vertebrae hanging by a thread on your skull. I'm not sure how you are still alive, Joey. He told me I needed major surgery and he booked it in for February 13, 2013. But he told me and he looked me in my eyes, you have a 40% chance of something going bad. You could either become paralyzed or even worse, you could die. I was flooded with many emotions. I was happy, scared, mad, and now very confused. I asked him, can I avoid this surgery? He told me, Joey, you need to listen to me. You can die or get paralyzed with a small fall leaving here. You could slip. A little small car crash could kill you. You are hanging by a thread. I looked him in the eyes. I said, fine, let's do this. We might as well. I can't go on like this. If I do, I probably will take my own life. That drive home, I was very cautious of my neck. I now knew what was wrong with me and I just wanted to get home as fast as I could. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs, I'm not crazy. I went to my parents, I sat down with them. They saw the shocked look on my face. They looked at me and my dad, I remember him saying, you're fine, right? Everything's good. I said, actually dad, I need major surgery. My mom and dad both looked at me shocked. I grabbed the house line and called my doctor's office. In a professional way, I said the next time a patient tells you something is wrong and he can feel it or she can feel it, have some compassion for them and make sure you tell the doctor I need major, major surgery. I was scared but relieved. Those were long two months not knowing if anything could kill me before my surgery. The countdown to surgery was on, but hey, at least I was not crazy. Chapter 22, February 13th, 2013. It was a long, quiet drive with my parents. It was funny, two months before the surgery date, my mother's friend and a longtime family friend, her name is Mrs. Conti, she gave me a prayer that was a St. Michael's Prayer booklet. I swear, the chances of me going to St. Michael's Hospital to do that surgery after reading this prayer book for the last two months was very strange to me, but very comforting. In the waiting room before my surgery, my parents and I waited to be called in. There was about 20 to 30 people in that room. I was just standing while my parents were sitting down and I finally was able to release four years of build up anger, confusion, and so many other emotions. I belted out a cry so loud, I could imagine what those 20 to 30 people were thinking. I remember walking into the surgery room, it was very cold. I asked my surgeon, how many have you done today? He goes, Joy, it's my second. I said, did you drink anything last night? He's like, no. Did you get in a fight with your wife? He said, no. I said, are you in a good mood? He said, yes, Joey. Everybody was talking about something they watched on TV. They were having a blast. I remember they laid me on my stomach. They put a needle in my hand and I was lights out. My dad and mom told me months later that I was fatal during my surgery. When I woke up, I asked the nurse right away, am I paralyzed? She pinched my leg with a pin and on my toes. I jumped up. She goes, no, you're not. I passed out. I remember waking up and I needed a lot of drugs. They gave me a buzzer where every five minutes I was allowed to put morphine in my body. I woke up stiff and in pain. Wow, the drive home hurt. Two days at the hospital, painkillers did nothing at first. I remember I had to sleep on a chair for over two months and I had to wear a neck brace for four months. But for some weird reason, I enjoyed this pain because for once, I knew where the pain was coming from, and it was physical, not mental. I embraced it. Recovering was boring. I did not mind the pain, like I said. Showering and doing regular things was tough, but I knew I'd been in worse places before. I got a job, actually, set downtown for June 1st, and I remember going to the job interview with a neck brace. They told me I was hired. I went to the job at a neck brace. They probably thought I looked a little weird coming there with a neck brace, but I had a suit on and I went through it. It was all starting to come together. My neck brace came off May 1st. I felt scared without my neck brace. It felt like I needed my neck brace going forward, but I knew it was the right thing to do. 
Chapter 23. My friend Alex. My new job was actually across from his condo. I asked him, can I live with you? I couldn't believe he said yes. I actually, I gave him no choice. I showed up with all my luggage. And I never thought I was going to leave my parents' house for the last four years. And now I was staying at my friend's house. I'd never seen that happening. The first night was very hard on me, and I'll let you know why. For the last four years, besides the South Carolina, the only bed I slept in was my own bed in my parents' place. I was getting used to my new body. I still had some form of OCD. My friend Alex was about to test me on that. I remember I left his sink on for 10 hours. He almost put me back in my neck brace. I remember I bought slippers to take every time I took a shower. And I remember he flipped the slippers over. I was tired of buying new slippers every day. I'll never forget this story. I went to take a shower. I came back out. And he goes, hey, why don't you go check your soap in the shower? I went back to the shower. He placed his soap on top of mine. I had a panic attack. He's like, Joey, you could get through this. I remember I would never clean his place up because I didn't want to touch Lysol or anything like that because I didn't want nothing contaminating my body. He told me, you either clean my counter or go back home. So I had no choice to clean his counter. His cleaning ladies hated me. His poor mom. I thought I was going to live with him forever. And I'll never forget the day he came home and said, you have till September 1st to buy a new place and to go on your own because you're driving me nuts. I was still afraid of huge condos and his was only six floors. It was a blessing in disguise. I remember at the time, my new boss, his mother, was a real estate agent and she found me a townhouse. The crazy thing about it, that on my vision board, I had the picture of the CN Tower, but I remember putting this on my vision board thinking, I'm afraid of heights. How am I ever going to see the CN Tower? My move-in date was set for November 1st, 2013. When I went into the townhouse, I'll never forget that I could see the CN Tower from my kitchen, my family room, my bedroom, and my rooftop terrace. I was like, wow, my vision board is coming to life. I can never thank him enough. He is a saint, and he's in my family's eyes. They love him more than me. If he did not let me stay with him for those three months... Who knows where I'd be today. I'd probably be still living at my parents' house. I love you, buddy. Chapter 24, Las Vegas, September 2013. The Las Vegas logo was on my vision board for four years. I remember I've been there so many times. Will I ever get back? I never, ever thought it was going to happen again. I was late for my flight. I booked it. My friend said I could come with them on a bachelor party. I was so late for my flight. I had no time to worry. I remember I landed in Vegas. I got through my flight. I had my first meal with my friend AJ, and I just started crying. I thought, I can't believe I'm here. I feel good. I don't have anxiety. I don't have pain. And unlike my South Carolina trip, which I suffered, all my emotions came out. I cried with tears of joy for at least 30 minutes. It all came out. I had no safety pills on me. No fear, again, no anxiety, no pain, and a little bit of OCD left. I really soaked in the small things on that trip. It will always be my favorite trip ever. Chapter 25, Moving Day, November 1st, 2013. I was very nervous about moving in. Will I have another panic attack and retreat home like I did on that tall building on April 16, 2009 and go back to my parents' home? In 2009, April 16, I thought I would never leave my parents' house again, like ever. Again, I could see the CN Tower on all three floors of my new home. I just stared at the city from my room for hours, just smiling. I remember going to the rooftop and thinking, I bought this place and I now live here and I'm on my own. I can't believe it. A couple years back, I couldn't drive downtown and now I'm living downtown. Each day was a blessing. My parents and my family were so happy. Funny thing is, all my windows in my new townhouse faced the building that I had the panic attack in. It was a reminder every day how bad things were. It took me 1,735 days to get there at that moment. Man, I can't believe where I am right now. 
The reason why I'm sharing my journey with an audience is because of one Facebook video I seen. It was about a professor speaking to his class. He was talking about his nephew, how his nephew used to be a good boy growing up, and he was around nine years old at the time where he started to suffer, and they couldn't figure out why. He was telling the class his nine-year-old nephew beat up a little girl in the playground, and they don't even know where this was coming from. One day, he was with his nephew trying to see if he was doing better, and he seen a picture that his nephew drew of him hanging himself, and the uncle was telling the nephew, why do you feel like this? And the nephew responded, I don't feel myself. I don't like the way I feel. And the professor who was speaking to his class telling the story was really choked up. So the professor, who knew a lot of people in high places, said, let's try to get my nephew a CAT scan. He was rejected many times. Long story short, he finally got him that CAT scan, and it showed there was a tumor against his brain. They had surgery right away, and his nephew came back to the kid he used to be. And for some reason, seeing that kid suffer, seeing how it all transpired, even though it was a little short video, really hit home for me. And I decided to put my story, maybe in a couple sentences, under the comment section. I've never done that before. I don't think I'll ever do it again. So I did it, not thinking anything of it. Next day I woke up with an overwhelming response. People from all around North America were messaging me. Your story is an inspiration. You should write it out more. And I'd think to myself, well, I don't think I'm going to do that. I had other people messaging me. My daughter's suffering. Your story gives us hope. And another message and another message. And it kept on piling in. I still get messages today, and this is a year ago. I remember telling my mom, maybe I should write something out. But I've tried to write the story out, which was my own story, of course, many times before. And I just couldn't finish the story because I didn't want to relive those moments I had. But I knew something deep down inside said to me, I need to help people because I would have loved to have this help when I was suffering. And that's why I'm telling you my story. So many years have passed since that day where everything changed. How I feel about life now, nothing gets to me. I'm grateful for every day. You could get mad at me. You could scream at me. I won't even budge. Nothing bothers me. I'm very grateful for how I feel compared to how I felt. Tira Avante was something that my grandfather, my nono, used to say to all of us when things weren't going well. Push forward, forget about it, keep moving forward. And I really felt that that saying was perfect for this story. Again, I'm grateful for every day. I shouldn't be here right now, so I'm not going to complain moving forward. If you're not feeling yourself and nobody is helping you and you're not finding a solution, it doesn't mean that nothing is wrong. Don't ever give up. Push forward.